Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. One of the primary topics on my channel is reality creation, the law of attraction, the law of assumption, the law of mind. We are continually discussing this very exciting subject that a single thought can create a reality. I want to take this a little bit further. I was inspired recently by reading some Abraham and I really think that joy is the secret to the law of attraction. Esther and Jerry Hicks said, what is the purpose of life? It is joy. What is the reason of life? It is joy. That made me think about joy and what it means. This episode is about what some people refer to as telementation, which is a specific kind of meditating that focuses on the law of attraction. In summary, what this episode shows you is that if you know and feel something deeply within your consciousness, it will materialize in physical reality. In other words, If a person knows and feels that, for example, their wife will have a particularly good day and they know it without a shadow of a doubt, so convinced that it is true that he feels it at the deepest part of his being, it will occur without exception in physical reality. This is the principal law of the cosmos. The way you feel about reality at your innermost being will become how reality is structured. For example, if you feel at your innermost being that reality is joyous and prosperous for humans, then your life and those around you will have joy and prosperity. This is the most powerful force in the universe. All of us have it and can utilize it right now in this moment as you're listening to me. And it is our absolute key to personal safety and protection. Deep inner satisfaction, joy, and happiness. And to profound social justice worldwide. Why yet another episode on the law of attraction? I have hundreds of them. Because one does not master the law of attraction by listening to 200, 300, or 400 episodes or reading 500 books. One learns to master the law of attraction by practicing it. There are some key points you need to know before you practice. And while you are learning how to steer and control the law of attraction, but those can be easily expounded in a few minutes. And after that, you'll master it. And thus, Have anything that you want, only if you practice. Here's one of the most important things you will learn to know. You have to find joy in your law of attraction exercises and practice. If you're going to succeed, if it's not fun or joyful, you won't stick with it and you won't have success no matter how determined you are. How do you do this? Your meditation must be religious ecstasy, joy, at least to some degree, sort of like what St. Teresa, Buddha, or the Hindu ecstatics have expressed. You don't have to be falling blind, blinded by the light of God every day, like St. Paul on the road to Damascus, but you will need to learn to transform your life to at least some degree into a life of joy and happiness. This is what you will learn in this episode. And trust me, it's easy. It's what you've been longing for deep down all of your life. In actuality, spiritual ecstasy is what the proper application of the law of attraction is at its core. And thus, when you practice it properly, you will want to practice it more and more since it is a form of happiness. This is a happiness likely far deeper than any happiness you have ever felt hitherto, far deeper than what television, 
social media, culture, chasing money, church, or chit-chat can ever give you. It is something akin to the profound soul-level joy you felt when you looked into your child's eyes for the first time, the day that they were born. Proper application of reality creation practices is easy to learn and is the bliss of Thoreau in his forest home, the peace of Gandhi saving the citizens of India, and it is the lightning joy of a flower softly opening as birds sing in the morning. The core of the meditation for reality creation is ineffable joy and freedom because the core of you is ineffable joy and freedom. If you've not discovered this, then that is just because you have not taken the time to look within yourself to see what you're made of, which is joy, divinity, light, and freedom. Why do you think it says in Genesis 1 that you are created in God's image? That means that you, you, the deeper inner consciousness, are ineffable joy and freedom since you are in God's image in your innermost self. In order to succeed with the law of attraction, the law of assumption, whatever we want to call it, you need to gradually make some sort of meditation practice a central focus in your life. Not obsessively, but joyfully. And when I say meditation, it doesn't mean sitting down cross-legged and closing your eyes. It means using your imagination. Other episodes and books on the law of attraction that tell you that you need to just sit for five minutes each day, practicing it, are not correct. Those who follow those books will likely fail. And I've listened to seemingly countless students who have told me all about failures to whom following such books they first started working. Therefore, we need to be able to carry out some sort of practice easily, happily, and in times of stress too. When you have spare moments, when you are, for example, walking the dog, getting the mail, brushing your teeth, driving or biking to work, laying in bed as you fall asleep at night, which is my favorite, and so on. For those reasons, if you're not religiously joyful in your practice, filled with at least some sort of spiritual happiness and thus wanting to do the practice as much as anything you do at any part of any given day, working from your God-illuminated energy-intensive core of yourself, feeling that God drunken happiness, there is no way you will succeed. You must first develop and uncover your inner Godhood and then start with simple exercises of meditation. You must be looking forward to your practice more than anything in the world and then you will succeed and you'll feel that you have never felt before and you'll feel what you have always longed for, the infinite light of divinity that is everywhere. Life is immensely busy for most of us, and we will fail at the law of attraction unless we can do it in the spare moments of our lives when we have little pockets of time. And practicing it, you will see deeply peaceful, soulful, enjoyable, and spiritual. In fact, you will see when you learn the practice, the art of the meditation of the law of attraction or imagination that the deep feelings you have when you are in the mode of imagining is what you really are. What you've always longed to feel, peace you've always longed for, and it is the satisfaction that you've always had at your core, even though you did not know it. You will never be happier than when you are in that perfect mode of consciousness. It is a peace you cannot fathom from your ordinary egotistical state of consciousness. So proper use of the imagination is not just about getting what you want or appropriately put getting what you will yourself to receive. It's also about feeling as good as you've ever felt. It's about joy literally all the time and literally injecting that radiance into all people and life forms around you. What a world we would live in if our schools taught this information, 
Oftentimes I have people come to me that have read about the law of attraction that have focused entirely on their thoughts. And even though Neville Goddard says the feeling is the secret, they are more concerned about their thoughts, but they're not focusing on their feelings first. At their base, your feelings, those things inside of you have always been inside of you, are profoundly spiritual, containing ecstasy. It does not matter if you're thin or not, old or young, quick thinking or not. If you have feelings in you, then they at their deep base are cosmic powers. Most likely you have not noticed this or have not known how to notice from this inner spiritualism that you all have deep within you. The cosmos is created. And from that inner soulfulness, reality creation can be exercised. Imagination is the greatest human power there is. But very few humans know that it even exists. Yes, I talk about it a lot on this channel. But most people do not realize the power of their imagination. If I believe and feel deeply within myself, in the most inner parts of my consciousness, that reality is safe and wonderful, with my imagination, then my life will be safe and wonderful for me. Or as another example, if I believe that reality is unsafe and dangerous with my imagination, then danger and lack of safety will come my way repeatedly. If I believe and feel from my innermost being that I am an ideal husband and father, then things fall into place such that I act so that my wife and my children love me surprisingly deeply. Or more startlingly, if I am playing basketball and if I believe in a deep, specific way that the shot I am about to take or am taking will miss, then it will indeed miss. Or if I believe and feel it will not miss, then it won't. All of us have this incredible inner power of imagination. It is the answer to virtually all of our problems and not taking control of this inner force and instead letting fear and pain and repressed feelings run amok within us rather than looking within and facing them is the cause of all of our problems since by living in such a state we will create such a world for ourselves since that is what our innermostness feels and believes imagination is the key to our feeling deep satisfaction and happiness in life but few know that imagination even exists on the level that we're talking about. And fewer yet know how to exercise and control this power. Imagination is a meditational pursuit and it is a religious spiritual way of life. It is therefore not something that you rush through for five minutes each day or in a careless, unsoulful manner. Imagination involves practicing the daily practice and noticing the staggering effects of it in your life. And it does not involve conceptual analysis or intellectual philosophy. So it is only appropriate that we focus mostly on technique and the art of imagination rather than on philosophy or other superfluous issues not directly connected to the practice of imagination and success in your life. When most people hear about reality creation through imagination, after being raised their entire life to believe that reality involves something opposite of their thoughts or imagination, they respond in such a way they usually fall into one of two groups. First, those who reject the theory that imagining creates reality because it is such a startling thesis and such a shocking model of reality in their eyes that are preconditioned to believe otherwise. It is too much of a paradigm shift for them to accept. And instead, they go on believing the other false view of reality, which is called cause and effect. Or there's the second group, those who accept the theory that imagining creates reality, but they fail in implementing its principles in daily life because they're not motivated enough. And they don't care enough or don't have proper instruction or get scared of the incredible power of the imagination. Those who fall in 
to the first group will never learn the art of imagination, of course. And those in the second group will not learn it either because they do not see imagination already the ruler of their life. And by that very fact, they imagine a reality for themselves where imagination is nonsensical in their eyes. They are like Luke Skywalker in The Empire Strikes Back. Or when Luke Skywalker said to Yoda, I don't believe it, after Yoda telekinetically removed Skywalker's spaceship from the swamp, and where Yoda responded, that is why you fail. What is the evidence for the existence of imagination creating reality? Is the study scientific? The only real proof or evidence that professional science has presented that I know of currently for the theory of imagination creating reality is from interpretation of quantum physics, especially the so-called Copenhagen interpretation. We don't need to be concerned with this issue of giving scientific evidence for the existence of imagination creating reality. I've done my very best to document the scientific fact of this in other episodes. I'm not sure that imagination can be a scientific theory unless we have a widespread revolution in cultural thought. Science involves what people can see and agree on. For example, we can all agree that the sky is blue and that quantum particles flicker. We can point to these, talk about them, and do experiments with them. Such perceptual situations are needed to carry out scientific pursuits, but examining imagination and the law of attraction is not such an endeavor, since it is based deeply in consciousness. Consciousness is not something we can take and place on the table and all stand back and analyze. If we cannot, it may be difficult to bring it into the scientific domain. So, examining imagination as a reality creator is primarily a philosophy and a meditative art, and we need not trouble ourselves with trying to prove to others that it is real. You will learn that it's real through practice and experimentation. If, however, we were as a culture all doing and succeeding at carrying out imaginative practices through meditation, we would have observable results since we'd all see it working in our lives and we could all talk about results we've each had and imagination would be somewhat scientific. That's the purpose of this channel is to talk about it in this way. I believe that that is what's happening now is a cultural wide revolution in our understanding of reality, which is influencing our interest, knowledge, and behavior in a specific way. It is interesting to note that many scientists are coming to the conclusions in their research that support the thesis that imagination creates reality. And it's perhaps a correct theory of reality. It is no secret that the great founders of quantum physics endorsed the idea that reality or particles of energy are created by observation and thus by consciousness or more technically put the wave functions are collapsed by acts of observation i.e acts of consciousness no elementary particle or phenomenon is a real phenomenon until it is an observed phenomenon according to the physicist john wheeler this is a key feature of the copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics which is not a science in itself, but is a set of ideas and theories that have grown up around trying to explain some of the scientific experiments that have been carried out in the area of quantum mechanics. What is interesting about this theory is that it involves the idea that at least one aspect of our consciousness, the act of perceiving, is creating reality. In his book about quantum physics and consciousness, Jay Satinover writes, at the quantum level, matter itself actually looks and behaves in the words of one physicist, more like a thought than like the cogs of a machine. This is a little different from the Copenhagen interpretation just discussed, but it involves, as the Copenhagen interpretation also involves, is the idea that the prime matter of the cosmos and our thoughts are the same sort of stuff and thus can influence each other, since thought stuff can influence other thought stuff as our own inner minds show. So it is interesting. Physics involves the idea that we 
probe nature to the smallest realms, we find energy that apparently is interacting with and or created by our conscious processes. Since all of physical reality is composed of these particles and thoughts, then reality is overall a giant set of thoughts, or perhaps in some one grand thought stream. And this is very much in line with the concept that imagination creates reality. Continuing with this theme, introduced by Satinover, about quantum physicists have also discovered that reality is apparently not composed of matter, but rather of non-matter, the same sort of stuff that the mind is made of. Malkowski writes, so does the brain create the self, and could it simply be the size of the human brain that gives us our ability to think in ways far different from those of animals? If it were dolphins, would be a higher order of being than we are, and they are not. It is the mind and the workings of the central executive, not brain size, that distinguishes us as sapient beings. The functioning and organizing of such has engineered the building of civilizations. In this way, the nature of the self can be viewed as abstract and is the human consciousness that involves thought, perception, emotion, and memory and imagination. According to the longtime consciousness researcher, University of California professor of physiology, Benjamin Libet, the unity of human consciousness poses difficulties with traditional approaches to the brain-mind problem. After a long and distinguished career in neuroscience, Libet concludes that neural networks within the brain offer little insight into how subjective experience occurs. According to Libet, a knowledge of nerve cell structures and functions can never in itself explain or describe conscious subjective experience. There's nothing in the brain suggesting that subjective experience, the role of the observer, is actually occurring. So there are a few areas of science and philosophy that lead to the, the idea that the mind and the world particles are not only the same sort of stuff, but also they interact in a two-way telekinetic relationship. The further we penetrate into matter, the less matter we find, and the more of ourselves or thoughts or feelings we find. It's as if when we look into the heart of matter all throughout the cosmos, we find our innermost, most intimate selves everywhere. Cosmos is a product of and a type of thought and feeling consciousness. Although imagination is not difficult to master, I don't think that learning, using the imagination to create reality is quite as easy as other authors often tell us. Some are very optimistic, tell us that learning it is so simple that it is almost odd if you can't just pick it up in five minutes with great success. Yes, imagination is simple, but I disagree with the idea that we can learn this simple technique effortlessly and quickly. In fact, I think it takes a bit of practice that it's an art to get right. And after you do it, then it becomes easy. Proper use of the imagination involves a feeling and thought mode that is always flowing deep inside of us, but one which most of us are not used to being aware of, paying attention to or controlling. In fact, I think most do not even know about the innermost energy within them, and they will likely even have some initial difficulty in locating it, seeing it, and feeling it within themselves. Getting in touch with this power, this feeling power, deep within us takes practice. And it is something that needs to be treated with care. Because when you learn to steer and control this power, you will see it manifest things in physical reality. And you will be in awe over the incredible power of this force within you. It's the creative force of reality and there's nothing to take lightly. For these reasons, using the imagination properly to create joyous realities is something we all need to move into slowly. Doing so is very safe and enjoyable and you need not worry as you learn how to exercise your powers as a result of listening to this book or other places don't rush it you have plenty of time to learn it why don't you give yourself a month to get it figured out using meditative techniques and focusing the imagination is immensely powerful and not using it correctly can cause you problems I actually destroyed my car once when I was learning how to carry out this practice due to my inexperience, my overzealousness, and due to my lack of understanding of what 
to do with uncontrolled thoughts. So take your time and do it right. Give yourself a month to learn it, introducing yourself with imagination, with light projects. For example, attempt to will into existence something that you can initially believe with utmost faith. Try, for example, to will into existence that your best friend will call and talk to you out of the blue about rainforests. That's something that she or he is not normally inclined to do regularly. This technique is not a simple plaything. Rather, it is the ultimate power of the universe. The answer to all of our problems, dangerous if not executed initially in the early learning stages with care, and it is something that requires one to restructure their innermost consciousness in a few ways in order to execute properly. I've learned from so many others about this practice, and I'm forever grateful to them for sharing this gift with me, Neville Goddard, and particularly Joseph Murphy. But this is meant to go beyond these teachers. This is because I was not able to gain expertise in the art of imagining until I learned my own techniques for carrying it out. And that is the feeling-based telementation or meditative practice, the law of attraction or the law of assumption, should be called the law of focused feeling or the law of focusing. That is because it depends on what consciousness is doing, what it's focusing on, not on what the universe is doing or being attracted. Attraction. And I'm not sure exactly what attracting really means here in the deep mechanical and philosophical sense. It has to do with the mind and the cosmos, not just the mind state. This is interesting and worth exploring. But to understand and have success in the technique, we merely need to focus on our consciousness solely and then watch the cosmos respond, rather than on philosophy. Thus, rather than the law of attraction to describe this principle, we can create a word like telementation that focuses more on consciousness and telekinetic consciousness. Having success with this process must be understood as a mind alteration and or exercise if you want to learn it and succeed at it. And it is only secondarily that you will change the cosmos in order to create reality as you want it to be. When a conscious being participates in this process, she or he must focus, know, and feel. These are the keys to successful imagination. I did not have success with this until I reconstructed my spontaneous moment-to-moment -moment mental life to one of joy. This is of monumental importance. You will not succeed unless you alter the very bedrock of many aspects of the autopilot consciousness streaming through you from moment to moment. Even just doing this slightly makes all the difference in the world regarding your success. This may sound as if it is a difficult endeavor, but it's easy even effortless to do. All who are listening to this should know that the autopilot consciousness, since it is streaming through you from moment to moment, and since it probably makes up most of what you have known yourself to be. As Cypher writes, most of our actions are due to automatic responses to stimuli. Gurdjieff and Duspensky write that we spend most of, if not all, of our life in an automatic pilot existence which they call waking sleep. The mechanical state is quite similar to the behavior of inorganic or organic chemical reactions in that no real thought is claimed to be involved. The human machine simply moves in a prescribed stimulus response path. Let me put the matters we are discussing here in another way. If I sit and meditate and focus on a specific target to be manifested in my imaginational work, for example, let's say I wanted to will into existence that my wife will have a particularly good day today. And I have successful meditation. But then after the meditation is done, I return to the moment to moment autopilot consciousness streaming through me. But that autopilot consciousness involved before my meditation session, some pessimistic thoughts such as, oh, she's too busy or she'll be so stressed out. Then my mind will inadvertently carry out by manifesting that stressed out target instead and my wife will certainly not have as good of a day. You see how that works? 
It's your innermost feeling and thoughts that manifest in reality. And you cannot transform or keep track of all of your innermost thoughts and feelings all the time. So what is needed to be done for you is to change the mood, the vibe, the spirit overall of your innermost consciousness. Doing that ensures that really any thought or feeling that emerges in the deep realm will be filled with optimism, joy, and spirituality. And thus, you will create for yourself a life of prosperity, satisfaction, happiness, and bliss. We all have tendencies to focus on. Pessimistic assumptions. Mistakenly taking these assumptions as facts, holding them in our moment-to-moment autopilot consciousness, thus allowing them to infect our innermost consciousness. These are the products of our bitterness over suffering we have undergone in the past and our consequent tendency to feel sorry for ourselves or remain angry over that suffering. Also, these pessimistic tendencies are the products of growing up in a culture that we are given a cause and effect framework that we have been inculcated with. Cause and effect is a false, unverifiable philosophy that makes us feel helpless as if it is the outer world that is shaping our lives, and thus we have little control over things. This is the opposite of using the imagination properly, the true philosophy, and it has infected nearly all of us. It certainly inhibited my own work when I was learning how to properly create my reality. For reasons such as these, I did not have success when I tried to use my imagination to create reality until I restructured my autopilot consciousness streaming through me, getting it to consist of a flux that involved the optimistic and focused contents of consciousness that I deliberately inputted into all aspects of my consciousness. Again, this is all very easy to do. To give you a hint, the way to do this is to have a frequent, successful meditative session, even only two or five minutes or so at various times throughout the day where you focus on targets in reality that you want to manifest. When I learned to do this frequently and with this specific and repeatable right feeling state in me, my autopilot consciousness rather quickly transformed in the contents of focused meditation session. In other words, doing very focused, short, but frequent meditative sessions in a state of joy throughout the day, radically changed my entire mind permanently. If my frequent focusing sessions continually involved much optimism about my life, then shortly after my moment-to-moment autopilot consciousness would start to be imbued with optimism also. The sessions that I directed flooded my consciousness, and soon my consciousness was transformed into the content, optimism, and joy of those sessions. Much of this has to do with, to paraphrase Yoda, by unlearning what we have learned. We have all been indirectly taught in our schools and on television that thoughts do not create reality. It's not mentioned, so it's overlooked. And there are other non-verifiable theories of reality that get instilled in our minds as alternatives And instead, we become firmly set in the philosophy of cause and effect. You have to eliminate the belief that causal chains even exist. We need to believe things happen because our minds generate them, not because other events generate them in causal chains of events. The key is to believe and feel fully down to the core of your being that you happen to things rather than things happen to you and that the things you want to happen will happen. You need to understand this to the point that these sort of beliefs, or more specifically, these sorts of knowings become part of your autopilot consciousness streaming through you from moment to moment, flowing effortlessly, spontaneously within you at all times, offering the implanted thoughts from culture. This will all become easier and easier after you do the work for a little bit. It took me a long time to really understand that causation is not the correct philosophy of reality and that rather imagination, I happen to things, describes what is actually going on in the world. 
Now I want to switch gears and focus on a technique involved in carrying out the imagination. Above, I've said that the key is getting your deepest consciousness and feelings to know, feel, and focus on your target. We need to explore what these words mean. Knowing is merely having a total belief, convincing yourself completely down to the core of your being that some target of your choice is real. Feeling just means that you know the realness of the existence of the target so assuredly deep within you that you feel it in your bones in the deepest recesses of your feelings. And focusing merely means you're reprogramming your autopilot moment-to-moment -moment consciousness. A person is always carrying out imagination in their life. Whether they know it or not, they're always using the law of attraction. In other words, a person's innermost consciousness and feeling states are continually creating reality, whether they know it or not. But most people do not know that this is going on. Typically, people never stop to look at their innermost feelings and thoughts to compare them to the events of the world to notice the one-to-one -one correspondence between them. Therefore, they're not making use of this ultimate power in the universe that they have flowing within them and they fear something bad will happen to them. When they are dwelling in their autopilot consciousness, they will create its existence or some approximation of its existence simply because they are not in control of their special power. The key is to control your innermost consciousness so as to have a world you most desire materialize from your innermost consciousness rather than the world you fear materialize from it. The process is frequently undermined because in your ordinary life, when you're going about your activities, your subconscious or deep innermost thoughts and feelings hold doubt and pessimism about your life, mainly due to how you have been trained in your upbringing to believe that bad things happen to me rather than me happening to things. These feelings and thoughts might be in the form of, oh, X will never happen to me, or I will never get X. I don't deserve X. I hope I get X. Hope is not knowing, not focusing on a desired target. So you must imagine properly. It must be enjoyable or you will fail. I recommend that before you do anything in your work, you learn to generate these little bits of quiet ecstasy within you by merely relaxing unaggressively and looking inward at your feeling. Get started on this. And after you get the hang of this a few days, a week, you can start to practice this more and more. Go back in your life and find moments of joy and start to recreate these feelings of joy, little bits and pieces of moments of joy. Some people like to use the word gratitude, but I'm picking joy because you don't necessarily have to have gratitude to have joy. Joy is the secret. What you are at your core is God. You have this God power within you. Now I know that triggers you and you might not believe me. You have this spark within you that is all powerful. If you're having trouble focusing, you can do certain things to get yourself more focused. I know some people like to eat chocolate before they do it. Your sessions of imagination don't need to be contrived. You don't necessarily need incense and candles or certain sitting postures. All you need is a quiet moment to yourself when you're falling asleep at night, checking the mailbox, walking up the stairs, using the bathroom, walking to your car. Those are the sort of situations that are perfect for these sessions. And when you get experienced with it, you may even be able to do it in the most noisy moments of life. It may take you a few days or weeks to learn to instantly shift your attention during the busyness of your day into joy and then seconds earlier your mind is preoccupied with something else the key is to feel deeply Neville Goddard would tell us that we have to feel exactly the state of the thing we want to create and I find in some cases that's hard for people to do because it's hard to identify that feeling so I'm telling you to identify the feeling of joy and that state will help you to create the thing that you want because you shouldn't be creating anything other than out of joy. Feel deeply. Don't worry about the why. You'll never know how it happens. It always works. It works every single time. It's the truth of it. But you have to have joy in the practice of it. I mix my practice 
with mindfulness meditations. I listen to music that is inherently soothing and joyous. I try to bring myself in a very joyous and spiritualized state where I know that my future is wonderful, blissful, and thus there is much to live for. If you're practicing meditation and taking care of yourself, the feelings needed for this work will flow forth and sometimes will truly explode and radiate from you so much that you may even get the feeling that others can see it bursting forth from you. It's a chain reaction and a feedback loop. The more you practice, the more you get what you want in life, and the more you get what you want in life, the better you feel about life, and the better you feel, the better this will go. Sometimes it results in immediate outcomes, and other times it doesn't. Sometimes the results are so amazing that it's as if money suddenly falls out of the sky, literally. When one becomes a bit more experienced, it is as if this positiveness of the practice and the joy starts to flood your consciousness, your feeling and being. You're overjoyed, preoccupied in all moments with this joy filling you up. The key is that the joy becomes the autopilot. The subconscious mind is a repeating and looping program, which is far more powerful, complex, and critical to life. The program in its basic structure is created from a very early age, and it contains our deepest feelings, and thus comprises a thick and powerful instrument to work with. So many of us have saddened and damaged our subconsciousness due to what has happened to us in the past and what people have told us when we were young, the idea is to recreate and retrain the subconscious with telementational work, and this will allow for a new way of life, spontaneously based. All of us have been beaten up through our lives. We have deep pains and resentments, deep longings and forlornness over dreams unfulfilled. Even if you're not aware of this on a daily basis, your subconscious is, and it lives from these letdowns. We all need to change this state of being that is done by choosing joy. And joy is the secret. Joy is the secret to harnessing this force. Make that your focus. If you leave this episode with one thing, understand that the secret to creating the reality that you want is joy. Focus on it, think about it, remember it, and enter it into your practice. And the more and more you bring this feeling of joy up, the more and more you will create a joyful world because joy is the secret. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com and welcome to The Reality Revolution.